Hey guys, hope you all are having a fantastic day. We got quite a bit of information to go through, and need to provide some important developments regarding the debt ceiling. Before we start, let me invite you guys over to my Discord, we have been cooking big time these last couple of days, so if you are a day trader or are looking to trade more passively with early alerts at the beginning of every week, come check us out. With that said, let's get started. Good news for the country, the debt talks in the US are reaching their final stages, with reports suggesting that a potential deal will raise the country's $31.4 trillion debt ceiling and implement spending limits for the next two years. US Representative Kevin Hearn, who leads the largest Republican caucus, stated that a deal is expected to be reached by this afternoon. Delving deeper into the details, Republican negotiators have reportedly agreed on a smaller 3% increase in defense spending. Non-defense discretionary spending is anticipated to remain at its current levels. The White House is considering scaling back increased funding for the Internal Revenue Service, slashing $10 billion from the planned $80 billion budget increase for the agency, which was aimed at targeting wealthy individuals. At present, the White House and Republican proposals for the debt limit differ by approximately $70 billion in terms of discretionary spending. As a contingency plan, the Biden administration is exploring options based on a plan formulated after the 2011 debt ceiling deadlock. This plan involves federal agencies submitting payments to the Treasury no earlier than the day before they are due. In contrast, the current system allows payment files to be submitted well ahead of their due dates. If the Treasury lacks sufficient funds to cover a full day's worth of payments, it would likely postpone payment until it has adequate funds. The Treasury has been preparing for the possibility of delaying some payments after June 1. Commentators from leading investing groups have expressed their views on the situation. They believe that the best outcome would be a clean debt ceiling raise without spending cuts. They argue that such a move would maintain the flow rate, potentially driving the stock market to new highs. Another contributor. James Passerno, emphasized that Treasury yields will remain a crucial real-time indicator of how the market is pricing in the risk of the debt ceiling. Currently, the consensus seems to be that a deal to avoid default is still the baseline assumption and markets have been holding strong these past couple of days because of that perception. That's also why today, when these news came out, the stock market rallied big time. On out last video, we lightly covered potential rate hikes in the future and I want to add to that. Picking up from where we left off, I believe if the markets are anticipating the release of the Fed minutes to signal upcoming rate cuts, they will be left disappointed. The minutes provided no indication of rate cuts, emphasizing the data-dependent approach mentioned by Powell on May 19 and highlighting the possibility of further rate hikes. For those who believe that the Fed would lower rates, it is evident from the minutes that it is not happening. Likewise, for those who thought the Fed had finished raising rates, that is also unlikely. On page 3 of the minutes, it was noted that survey responses from primary dealers and market participants showed little change in their macroeconomic outlooks compared to March, despite concerns about credit tightening. The minutes further revealed that respondents assigned a higher probability to the peak federal funds rate being between 5 and 5.25 percent compared to March. However, there was still a significant chance that the peak rate could go above 5.25 percent. Additionally, on page 10, it was emphasized that the language in the post-meeting statement should not be interpreted as signaling rate decreases in the target range for this year or ruling out further increases. Powell reiterated these points during the May 19 question and answer session, aligning with the summary of economic projections that indicated no rate cuts. He stressed the importance of closely monitoring the data and making decisions on a meeting-by-meeting -meeting basis. He also mentioned that rates might not need to rise as high as previously anticipated, but this doesn't mean the Fed has finished raising rates but rather, it suggests the possibility of further increases. If the Fed intended to halt rate hikes, it could have conveyed that message between the May meeting and the release of the minutes. However, the conveyed message was quite the opposite. The market has taken note of this, and as of May 25, the Fed fund futures have largely removed the possibility of rate cuts in 2023. The December Fed fund futures currently trade at 5%, with a 94% probability priced in for another rate hike by July. Powell's statements in the minutes dashed the hopes of those expecting an end to monetary policy tightening and a shift towards easing. If you previously believed that rate increases were finished, it may be worth reconsidering that stance or hoping for a significant deterioration in economic data. However, the current state of the economy suggests that such a scenario is highly unlikely, as the economy remains robust. 
the Atlanta Fed GDP model forecasts a real growth rate of 2.9% for the second quarter. With the combination of the Fed's longer message and a strong U.S. economy, the dollar has surged in value, along with both nominal and real yields. This situation resembles much of 2022, with tightening financial conditions likely to exert downward pressure on asset prices. Yeah, I get that the stock market wants to price in all the wrong in the world because it's dying to reach new highs, but that honestly feels unrealistic given that many expect economic conditions to worsen significantly over the next couple of months, enough so that our own government is saying we will enter a recession late summer. Even if we don't sink to new lows, it certainly does not mean we are going to run up big time. As much fun as trading Nvidia might have been, even that stuck is in its own bubble. I mean, tell me how a chip company is so close to evaluation so close to Apple of all companies. I get growth and forward-looking statements is what actually accounts for the traded prices of a corporation, but it should be nowhere near where it is now, even with the good forward guidance they showed. That's something that has been happening a lot lately with other companies, they're reaching an all-time high already. Microsoft has enjoyed a huge market rally, especially with the whole AI thing going on. If these mega-cap corporations are already sitting at all-time highs, then what exactly is the market going to recover from? Yeah, they don't comprise the entire stock market, but they do a significant portion of it, and given they lead the way forward, it would be insane to watch them double in size further in a year or two when the financial reports don't fundamentally back that. Talking about Microsoft and international relations, China has already begun taking direct action against the United States in anticipation for the potential for an armed conflict. This news came out and went without much coverage and it's mind-blowing that nobody really cared given China launched a preemptive attack on the US, which speaks to the sour and worsening relations the West has with them. In case you didn't know, China installed malware on systems in Guam, setting off alarms because Guam is a centerpiece of any American military response to move against Taiwan. I am going to summarize a great article by David Sanger at the New York Times. American intelligence agencies and Microsoft discovered a concerning intrusion at the same time that the FBI was analyzing equipment from the Chinese spy balloon incident in South Carolina. Mysterious computer code, installed by a Chinese government hacking group, appeared in telecommunication systems in Guam and other parts of the United States. This raised alarms because Guam plays a critical role in any potential American military response to an invasion or blockade of Taiwan. The Chinese hackers used a stealthy approach, infiltrating networks through home routers and other internet-connected consumer devices to make tracking the intrusion more challenging. The code responsible for the intrusion is known as a web shell, a malicious script that enables remote access to a server. Home routers, especially older models lacking updated software and protections, were particularly vulnerable to this attack. Instead of shooting down the computer code on live television like the spy balloon, Microsoft took a different approach. They published details of the code, allowing corporate users, manufacturers, and others to detect and remove it. In a coordinated effort, the National Security Agency, along with agencies from Australia, Britain, New Zealand, and Canada, released a 24-page advisory referring to Microsoft's findings and issuing broader warnings about the Chinese cyber activity. Microsoft identified the hacking group as Volt Typhoon and stated that it was part of a Chinese state-sponsored effort. The group targeted critical infrastructure, including communications, utilities, maritime operations, and transportation. The current intrusions seemed focused on espionage, but the Chinese hackers could potentially employ the code to launch destructive attacks by bypassing firewalls. To date, there is no evidence that the Chinese group has utilized its access for offensive attacks. Unlike Russian groups, Chinese intelligence and military hackers prioritize espionage activities. The Biden administration has remained tight-lipped about the findings from the equipment recovered from the spy balloon incident. It is unclear whether this silence is aimed at preventing the Chinese government from knowing what the US has discovered or to overcome the resulting diplomatic tensions caused by the incursion. President Biden referred to the balloon incident during a news conference in Hiroshima, Japan, acknowledging that it had further strained the already chilly relations between the US and China. He expressed optimism that relations would soon improve. China has never officially admitted to hacking into American networks, even in prominent cases like the theft of security clearance files from the Office of Personnel Management. However, China has warned its companies to be vigilant against American hacking, and leaked documents from Edward Snowden revealed American efforts to infiltrate Chinese targets. Telecommunications networks, including the system in Guam, 
are prime targets for hackers, particularly due to their importance in military communications. Microsoft's Threat Intelligence Unit discovered the code while investigating intrusion activity impacting a U.S. port and subsequently identified affected networks in Guam's telecommunications sector. Efforts to enhance the cybersecurity of critical infrastructure, including pipelines, rail systems, and water systems, have gained momentum under the Biden administration. Ann Neuberger, the Deputy National Security Advisor for Cyber and Emerging Technology, has been leading this initiative. Collaboration with trusted vendors and companies with expertise in threat detection, such as Microsoft, Google, Amazon, and telecommunications firms, plays a crucial role in improving cybersecurity practices and mitigating risks. The U.S. government has adopted a new approach of swiftly publishing such cybersecurity data to expose and disrupt malicious operations like the one conducted by the Chinese government. In the past, such information was often withheld or shared only with select entities, allowing hackers to maintain an advantage. The focus on Guam in this incident has drawn attention because of its significance in assessing China's capabilities and intentions regarding Taiwan. While Chinese President Xi Jinping has ordered the People's Liberation Army to be ready to take Taiwan by 2027, it does not guarantee an invasion. U.S. tabletop exercises envision attacks on satellite and ground communications, particularly near American installations critical for mobilizing military assets. Guam, with its air base and naval port, holds immense importance in this context. I find it funny that as much forward-looking as the markets are, they plainly ignore the possibility of an armed conflict in the Pacific. Putting that aside, we need to hyper-focus back on inflation. Today we received important developments from the Commerce Department that once again, show inflation is not cooling off at the needed rate. In fact, the latest inflation data could push Federal Reserve policymakers towards another interest rate hike, giving ammunition to those who argue that more actions are necessary to restore price stability. This is just adding on what we talked earlier in this video. According to the Commerce Department, the Personal Consumption Expenditures Price Index, the Fed's preferred inflation gauge, rose by a faster than expected 0.4% in April. Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester expressed her view on the matter, stating, When I look at the data and I look at what's happening with inflation numbers, I do think we're going to have to tighten a bit more. Everything is on the table in June. Compared to the previous year, the inflation measure increased by 4.4% from 4.2% the previous month. Excluding food and energy, the core PCE index rose by 0.4% from the prior month and 4.7% from April 20, 22. Diane Swank, chief economist at KPMG, commented that this is the wrong direction for the Fed. June will depend on getting outside of debt ceiling issues, but a July hike is now in play. Over the past 14 months, officials have already raised rates by 5 percentage points to combat inflation that exceeds their 2% target. With the benchmark rate now in a target range of 5% to 5.25% following a quarter-point increase earlier this month, Fed Chair Jerome Powell stated that policymakers can monitor the data and evolving outlook. Before the Federal Open Market Committee's next meeting on June 14, policymakers will have additional employment and consumer price data. However, the uncertainty surrounding the debt ceiling negotiations in Congress may make officials hesitant to raise rates. Nevertheless, investors have increased their bets on a rate hike next month to over 50% from 18% a week ago. This shift reflects recent hawkish speeches by Fed officials and signs of economic strength. The report on Friday revealed a 0.5% increase in consumer spending adjusted for prices, the strongest advance since the beginning of the year, leading to a jump in Treasury yields. Kathy Bostianchich, chief economist at Nationwide Life Insurance stated that the combination of inflation moving upward and consumer spending remaining so strong will increase the odds of the Fed raising rates another time in mid-June. Some Fed officials, including Atlanta Fed's Rafael Bostic and Philadelphia's Patrick Harker, have emphasized that the impact of banking failures on credit has yet to be fully felt. They argue that monetary policy works with a lag, and the official data may not yet show the full effect of higher rates. Derek Tang, an economist at L.H. Meyer, Monetary Policy Analytics, suggested it's going to take a bit more to unlodge them from a June pause, but it does raise the chance of another hike thereafter. The stronger the data flow, the more likely that next hike is in July rather than September. The minutes from the May meeting revealed that policymakers were uncertain about the amount of additional policy tightening required. They weighed the slower-than-expected progress on inflation and the resilient labor market against the possibility of a credit crunch following recent banking turmoil. 
This whole inflation thing is having a huge effect on the social fabric of the nation. You guys know how in American culture, it is expected that people move out immediately after they turn 18, something that has been embraced for decades, originally starting after the fantastic economic boom of the 1950s. Well, this is not a sustainable expectation to have anymore, for reasons pretty obvious. The cost of living is too high and the stagnation of wages too slow. According to a recent analysis by the Pew Research Center, in 2021, only 68% of 25-year-olds were living independently from their parents, 22% were married, and 17% had become parents themselves. In comparison, back in 1980, a staggering 84% were living on their own, 63% were married, and 39% had started a family. The challenges faced by the millennial generation, defined as those born between 1981 and 1996, have been widely documented. Factors such as student loan debt, skyrocketing housing costs, and a turbulent economy affected by the financial crisis and other disruptions have significantly impacted the financial well-being of many young Americans. The study examined five key markers of adulthood, having a full-time job, achieving financial independence, living independently, getting married, and starting a family. It revealed that young women today are more likely to be financially independent, with 56% of 25-year-old women achieving financial independence in 2021 compared to 50% in 1980. In contrast, men are experiencing a decline, with only 64% achieving financial independence compared to 77% in 1980. Pew also noted that the percentage of 25-year-old women working full-time has remained steady at 61%, while men have seen a decline from 85% in 1980 to 71% in the present day. Lastly, I want to go over a huge piece by Bloomberg that denotes the breakdown of Europe's economic engine written by Will I am Wilkes and Jana Rando. I am going to give you guys the rundown of all that was said, and it was something we actually touched on earlier about a year ago. For decades, Germany has been the economic powerhouse of Europe, steering the region through numerous crises. However, this resilience is now faltering, and it poses a grave danger for the entire continent. A combination of flawed energy policies, the decline of combustion engine cars, and a slow transition to new technologies is converging to pose the most significant threat to Germany's prosperity since reunification. Unfortunately, the current political leadership lacks the vision and capability to address the structural issues eroding the country's competitiveness. The CEO of BASF expressed concern, stating that Germany has been naive in thinking that everything is fine. Accumulating problems now lie ahead, and it remains uncertain if everyone realizes this. While Berlin has shown its ability to overcome crises in the past, the question now is whether it can pursue a sustained strategy. Unfortunately, the prospect appears remote. Chancellor Olaf's coalition government has been engaged in petty infighting over matters ranging from debt and spending to heat pumps and speed limits, diverting attention from the pressing energy challenges. The warning signs, however, are becoming increasingly difficult to ignore. Despite Scholz's reassurances earlier, data published recently revealed that the German economy has been contracting since October and has only experienced growth twice in the past five quarters. Economists predict that Germany's growth will lag behind the rest of the region for years to come, and the International Monetary Fund expects it to be the worst performing G7 economy this year. Despite this, Scholz maintains an optimistic outlook. Germany finds itself ill-equipped to meet the energy demands of its industrial base, overly reliant on traditional engineering, and lacking the necessary agility to pivot towards faster-growing sectors. These structural challenges present a harsh awakening for the center of European power, which has grown accustomed to uninterrupted prosperity. To its credit, Germany has industrial giants like Volkswagen, Siemens, and Bayer, as well as thousands of smaller middle-stand companies. Additionally, conservative spending habits have put Germany in a stronger fiscal position than its counterparts to support the necessary transformation. However, time is running out. The most urgent issue Germany faces is getting its energy transition back on track. Affordable power is essential for industrial competitiveness, yet even before the Russian gas supply issues, Germany had some of the highest electricity costs in Europe. Failure to stabilize the situation could lead to a significant exodus of manufacturers to other countries. In response to concerns, Berlin is considering implementing a cap on power prices for energy-intensive industries like chemicals until 2030, a plan that could cost taxpayers up to 30 billion euros. However, this would only provide a temporary solution and highlights Germany's desperate supply situation. With the closure of nuclear reactors and the push to phase out coal, 
Germany installed around 10 gigawatts of wind and solar capacity last year, only half the pace required to meet climate targets. The Scholz administration aims to connect approximately 625 million solar panels and 19,000 wind turbines by 2030, but promises to accelerate the rollout have yet to yield results. Furthermore, as demand for electricity is expected to surge due to electrification in various sectors, Germany lacks sufficient storage capacity to withstand disruptions. Germany also faces challenges in innovation. While it has a well-funded research and development system, much of the innovation is concentrated in established companies like Siemens and Volkswagen. The number of new startups in Germany is declining compared to other developed economies, partly due to excessive bureaucracy, cultural risk aversion, and limited financing options. Germany's technological edge, especially in the auto sector, is fading. While German brands like Porsche and BMW dominated the combustion engine era, the country has struggled to establish itself in the electric car market. Domestic dependency on overseas markets and raw materials, particularly China, poses a risk to Germany's wealth and social order. Two areas where Germany could expand its economy are finance and technology. The country's financial sector is fragmented, with a network of public sector savings banks controlling much of the wealth. The two largest listed banks, Deutsche Bank and Commerzbank, although on the path to recovery, are still undersized compared to their Wall Street counterparts. In technology, Germany lacks investment in digital technology, ranking poorly in fixed-line internet speeds and spending. Germany needs a long-term program to address these challenges, but the prospects appear uncertain. Chancellor Scholz's coalition government lacks a clear mandate, and political fragmentation risks intensifying as the population ages. The strains on the economy are already evident, with staffing problems causing significant output cuts for businesses. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development has highlighted that no major industrialized economy has faced such systematic challenges to its competitiveness and resilience from changing social, environmental, and regulatory pressures. The health of the German economy is vital not only for Europe but also for the continent's harmony and solidarity. So to summarize that, Germany, which has been Europe's economic engine for decades, is facing a breakdown in its resilience, posing a danger to the entire continent. Flawed energy policies, slow adoption of new technologies, and leadership lacking in addressing structural issues threaten Germany's prosperity. The country's economy has been contracting, and economists predict lagging growth for years to come. Germany's energy transition is off track, and high electricity costs hinder industrial competitiveness. The nation's innovation power is fading, particularly in the auto sector. Germany's finance and technology sectors also face challenges. Political instability, demographic shifts, and fragmented institutions add to the concerns. Germany's economic health is crucial for Europe's overall economy and unity. The world is changing at a rapid pace, and with stick inflation not cooling off, Europe and Asia's current situation not looking stable either, I am very weary about any positive news. Lastly, I want to go over a couple of personal things. For some reason, I've been getting attacked for not covering AMC or GME daily. Guys, there's nothing significant happening daily anymore. The stocks are trading where they are and when big news drop, I always quickly post a video. I also have other things happening in my life that require attention, and talking about GameStop and AMC takes a huge amount of time. I mean, I was devoting like 8 hours a day during 2021, and that is completely unsustainable long term, especially given there's no significant monetary compensation for it. My YouTube revenue is a laughing stock, but I will always monitor the situation and cover the more important aspects when they take place. I have not gone anywhere, I just can't devote 8 hours of my life into that anymore. Instead, I am covering the broader market and economic aspects of our life, which is honestly a bit more fun. Come join my Discord if you are interested in day trading. Thank you for watching this video through its end, I hope to see you all on the next one. To the moon!